shadowing us right behind us, right on the side of us. You could, you could kind of see the thing moving through the woods. Uh, all I can remember is flipping the light on, and I see this creature, and I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my mind, and the whole night, this isn't a man. And then this thing walks across the road, takes a turn towards us, and then leaps over a guardrail. Went to look forward, and there was a big black face. Squatch D TV. Exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch Detective, Steve Culls, and from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs, too. Here are your host, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch D TV for today's date, December 11th, 2022. I'm your host, your guide, the Squatch Detective, Steve Coles, along with my co host, Mr. Chris Bennett. Hello, Chris. Steve, good to see you, bud. I've been, I gotta confess, I've been watching you a little earlier on Nikki's show. That yeah, was interesting. I, yeah, that was quite the uh, job. And, of course, our guest tonight, the one, the only fork chop, Sean Forker. There he is. Hello, Sean. How are you tonight, my brother? I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me with you. And, uh, you know, Sean and I go way back. And, uh, man, it, it's so good to have you on the video version. It's been a few years. It's great that we have this now because back in the day it was a telephone and a blog talk radio and – um, you know, I heard you talking about that a couple of weeks ago on the show, like back in 06, yeah. it, it was you and me, man, it was you and that was me. And, uh, it started kind of a trend, I think. And now look at it. Here we are yeah, still six, going 6,000 hosts, but we're the, <laughs> we're, we're the old men of the crew. Yeah. Yeah. Still. Am I old yet? Am I still old yet? Uh, do you, do you have any kids out of high school? Yeah. I have one in college, Steve. You're old. You're old. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well you know those were those that was the, the, the days of uh yeah dial up internet you remember that your computer would dial the phone number then i do uh, you've got but, mail <laughs> but uh yeah i remember in the the old horrible sounding uh podcast you know you're so like this all the time <laughs> What? Wait, what did you say? You could try to edit them and bring them back as like special sometimes to re-release them for people. It's tough. It may have, it's it is it's dreadful. You yep. spend so much time editing and cleaning it up. It's not. Uh, I, well, I I know I did two. I did hard. one for the John Green episode I had done, mm. yeah. and then I had done the Eric Beckford one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, not the one with you though. Oh, it, thank God. That was, yeah, 
And and Sean Farker is the only person I know that shut Eric Beckshirt up. I did. Well, besides, maybe. besides no, Mother no. Nature, she took care of him forever. <laughs> but... oh. Uh. oh, Lord, that hurts. <laughs> I won. Uh, yeah, you here. did. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, uh, here is the fun thing. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people uh, are floating in uh, to the uh the chat tonight uh and uh you know usually we do a roll call but there's so many people in here right now um come on in good. children all welcome all welcome yeah. um good to see some folks in here good to see some new folks hopefully you'll subscribe to the channel and uh listen to some of this wonderful banter you know it's not going to be the you know 10 pounds of uh bs in a nine pound bag that you saw an hour earlier with the mouth from the south running his mouth. Uh, um, we are not scripted. Uh, no, we are people, not. Some people never learn. No. And if there's one takeaway from that is he panders to every crowd. I kind of half suspected he was going to come out and say that what he told us was just to satisfy us. And, of course, he's pandering to the crowd. And, you know, all oh, what? There's only so many people in here listening, yada, yada, yada. Well, the, the fact is, is that he will pander because he knows this will propagate, that that show will propagate and get passed around and, and looked. And, um, you know, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, I found out who my troll was in there, and he is some dude in New Hampshire that likes to uh, show glyphs and show, uh, you know, all these Sasquatch structures up in New Hampshire. So he must must be taking offense to my uh, making fun of glyphs and talking down about tree structures and uh, sorry to wreck his day, but what he has got is no evidence well, of Sasquatch. So Yeah, you know, I mean, it's not it's not possible. You can't rule out that uh, Bigfoots do make these things. It's just, I don't think anybody's seen one doing that. So. Well, I think it's the frequency upon which people find them that gets a little yeah. bit more concerning. You know, tree mm -hmm. natural tree falls become tree structures to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, James and I, Baker and I, have some land out there. And one of the things we noticed when we were out in the land is all these, you know, you could say tree structures. But yep. what it is is just the trees break and they fall on these formations, and yeah. there they are. But if you were to take somebody out there that was really, you know, dead set on, you know, trying to make these tree structures a thing, it'd be a tree structure everywhere. Well, they're going to find X's everywhere. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he's finding stuff every single time he goes out. And then has the nerve to tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Why? Because you're finding trees, you know, blown over and stacked and uh, in oh. the woods, you know. I was uh, one of those. I was watching uh, Bill Rigby, a friend of mine, on Facebook the other day. And they found this, you know, tree structure in the woods. And he just methodically tore that thing apart. And it was just good to see, you know, people using critical thinking and, you know, logic to you know, dispel some of this stuff. Not that guys, look, I want Bigfoot to be real just as much as anybody else. And I think, yeah. you know, I can comfortably say it is because of experiences I've had and, and, and whatnot, but to go out and prove that to somebody else is, is a different, that's a different beast altogether. And, and you're not going to do that by believing everything is Bigfoot. Believing everything you run into is uh, Sasquatch related. And if I had stuff happening to me as much as some people do, I think I'd have something to show for it, but there are people that go out there all the time and have something happen all the time. Yep. Impossible. That's, uh, you know? Yeah, that's that's beating the odds there. Uh, you can't really go out and uh, get a film of Bigfoot every day. <laughs> well, if we were to take one of these people into a place where there's been no Sasquatch activity at reported, doesn't mean there's no Bigfoot that's ever been there, just no reports. Right. You wonder if they would still have something right, you know, it, it, so it, it's, it's just interesting. There are hot spots. You know, we, you got put up here, the chestnut Ridge, you know, a crazy spot in Pennsylvania. There's other hot spots in Pennsylvania, but I, I think 
where we're at right now, because they're so popular, the oversaturation that's going to happen to these places, you're not going to be able to go and get yeah. the evidence you want or the, do the type of research you want to do because everybody wants to be there now. So we got to start finding new places to go. So I'm going to round out, round up a couple of these, you know, diehard believers and I'm going to put them on leashes and let them take me to these spots where they're sure. you know, having Bigfoot. Yep. Um, Somebody asked me if if I'm from Pennsylvania. You know, I'm from New York. Sean is from Pennsylvania. There he is. He's my neighbor to the north. Neighbor, yeah, he's my neighbor to the south, and Chris is my neighbor way more to the south. Well, yeah, in Kentucky. I'm really, yeah, they they call Kentucky the south, but we're kind of in the middle, yeah. though. Really, you know. And uh, welcome, Tracy, to the show. So, um, and then anybody we, else that's new, dinosaur hunter. Hello. We were neutral during the Civil War, uh, but. Uh, it's kind of funny because a lot of battles were fought right here. I mean, well, just down the street. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, we were supposed to be neutral, but, you know, hey, the North and the South met here and they kind of like beat up on each other. Okay. Yeah. And thank you for the history lesson, Mr. Bennett. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love it. Yes, it's, you know, we're not. You just get passionate about where you're passionate about your home. I get it. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm from and I'm from New York. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, I thought that you were going to play the uh, the intro to the Sopranos. <laughs> no. I, actually, the Sopranos were from New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, like yeah, um, yeah. So uh, that the show you guys just came out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think I tied him up pretty good on certain things because he couldn't answer straight. Especially when I when I asked him if he was filming with Minnow Films, he like nearly tripped over himself. So I'm almost half wondering if there's a shooting Sasquatch two coming out. Mm. Um, you know, which of course you know, got to start promoting now. Uh, yeah, I am like a kid with a whoopee question. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've had a soundboard, so but we'll we'll change up the sounds in a little bit. So uh, not today. Um, anyway, uh, so Sean, you were part of this uh, small town monsters, yeah. uh, the Sasquatch on Earth, the Ridge. Um, can you tell us about Chestnut Ridge? Um, I've been there. I've been close to there. I've been to the. Uh, you know, the Pennsylvania Bigfoot camping adventure, which is basically on the ridge or near the ridge and off. Yeah. Um, Eric keeps them pretty close to it. He's Fayette County, which is, you know, a huge area of activity. The ridge runs through it. Westmoreland County up into the Laurel Highlands. I guess the Chestnut Ridge is a part of the Laurel Highlands. And then up, you know, uh, just an area of of high strangeness in general not just bigfoot but you know i stay in the bigfoot lane because that's where you know that's that's my thing but the amount of sightings that have happened in that place is just unreal and there's i don't think you could put a reason as to why i i think it's a if you go into it it's because it's a heavily trafficked area now uh i think the research that's gone into this uh, since the 2000s have made it a lot, lot more popular than, you know, maybe maybe we need it to be because, you know, again, I worry about that. You know, we oversaturate these places and, and build them up and then everybody wants to go there. And not that it, we don't want people to get out and enjoy this, but there's the enjoyment and then there's the actual research part. And sometimes they're going to clash. And uh, yeah. But I wish I could say I knew what the cause was for this concentration of sightings in this area i used to think it was because there's so many researchers down there there's a lot of outlets to report it to stan gord eric altman pa bigfoot society uh Char you know, charlie, charlie wonton. wonton yeah <laughs> <laughs> charlie wonton he and his wife out there you know a lot of folks out there investigating the ridge uh so there's a lot of ways to get that information to people there's a lot of other areas of Pennsylvania too, up towards the Allegheny national forest is a huge area of uh, a lot of activity that I think is just now starting to get tapped into because people are starting to investigate that area. Uh, and that makes, you know, a world of difference in terms of trying to 
uh, you know, correlate data and get citing reports. People know somebody's there that's going to take them seriously. They'll start reporting it back in. So you got those two concentrated areas of citing in Pennsylvania. Is it because there's more activity that happens there than anyone else, anywhere else? I don't know. I think it's because there's just more active researchers there than anywhere else. I have a Charlie Wonton joke. Hmm. What happens at the Wonton household when they when their electric bill is too high? What's that, Steve? Lights off, and then they <laughs> dim some. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, that's, that's wow. Terrible. <laughs> that was bad. That was bad. <laughs> Even Charlie hit his face on that one. Uh, but we, we will probably be seeing a video of Charlie Wonton talking about that joke. <laughs> Turn off some, dim some. <laughs> dim some. Uh, Poor Charlie. Poor Charlie. Anyway, um, so let me ask you this. Have you found that since COVID that the Chestnut Ridge has gotten more saturated with people because people were getting out a lot more than they had done in previous years? You know, I wish I could say that with any kind of veracity. I think that I would expect because more people were out, we would have had a lot more sighting reports that have happened. I'm not privy to so many of them that come through there. You know, Altman gets them and shares them with us. Uh, Stan Gordon, you know, shares them when he gets them occasionally. Uh, he stays busy. But I thought that with so many people not having other, any other outlets to go to but into the woods, we would have had more. Perhaps we would have had more. And I'm rolling my eyes as I say this, more photographs, more videos. You know, we would have had something more through this but uh not as much as i thought we would have right right um because I, I you know the, the big thing in, in my area is i noticed that since covid everybody's discovered that area so now i go up there and it's like what you know usually the <clears throat> second or third week of september that place is empty and i'm like there's still people here what the hell yeah. so unfortunately I think we're fortunate a... i'm sorry steve i didn't mean to step on you there no i'm just saying that you know it, it it may it's made research in those particular areas a little more difficult with the influx of people. So. What I think is fortunate is that the areas that we research down here, and I say we, I mean Eric and them. I'm gonna I'm a special guest out there on the ridge. I don't get there as much as they do. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm making myself an authority. That's not what I'm saying. I uh the the areas we research down there are so off the beaten path, folks wouldn't find them. You, you have to, you know, know exactly where the hell you're going uh, to get to them. They're deep into the woods. They're not, uh, you know, a known trail. Yeah. So there are areas I'm confident that a lot of folks wouldn't be able to get to. So a lot of the research you get from those areas is uncontaminated. You know, you're getting, uh, you know, I think a little bit more reliable data than you would if you were out. And let's say Keystone State Park at this point. Keystone yeah. State Park is, you know, heavily that's in dairy right on the ridge chestnuts or keystone state park though is very heavily trafficked yeah and uh agent of the unexplained welcome to the show um since covid i've gotten more reports locally in mercer in lawrence county pennsylvania and uh brent over at the tall ones hello brent said yeah. locally here in washington people visiting woods increased 20 percent since covid so yeah i could see that yep um Ah, a question from uh, Kaiju Ninja, 1985, said, what kinds of things has Sean experienced that makes him believe that Bigfoot is out there? Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. One, uh -oh. um, if we go back <laughs> to the beginning of this, you know, into the t early 2000s when I became part of the PA Bigfoot Society, um, an incident that Tim Cassidy and I had in the woods in Keystone State Park where we both felt like we were hit with some sort of infrasound or, well, we don't know what it was. Infrasound seems to be the logical thing by the reaction I had. Tim still thinks it was some sort of pheromonal reaction that he experienced. Tim doubled over and was really nauseous. And I was really like on edge and amplified um, and scared, you know, crapless. And we heard this loud crashing through the brush 
And at that point in time, my fight or flight kicked in and I chased after it. And the next thing you know, I've got members of the PA Bigfoot Society chasing me, chasing after this thing because I was young and stupid. And, you know, you just don't go chasing after things that you, you know, don't know what they are. But uh, as we grouped back together, we got back into the power line clearing as we started walking down back towards the vehicles. Uh, Norm G, one of our uh, group members, Norm G Gagnon, I always butcher his last name. Uh, he's a, was a pretty well-known researcher at the time. He snapped a photograph of the tree line. And if you look at that photograph in the tree line, you can see a defined humanoid shape in the woods, not far from the area where uh, we believe the thing ran to the, after we ch had chased after it. It's just really interesting. And, you know, I don't put a lot of credence in photographs, Steve, I, but this was, you know, there's definitely something you could have said in that photograph that was humanoid shaped. So that's one thing. Uh, I recorded a sound file in Keystone State Forest. And if you, I think if you watched the last episode of uh, Sasquatch Unearthed the Ridge, uh, they play it. I sent that to Seth and the team for them to, uh, you know, put on there. And that was interesting because it was an interactive thing. I was responding to a sound I heard. I made a sound back. It made a sound back to me. And of all things, it sounded like a damn cow in the woods. Never understood that. It was just the sound it made. Uh, was so different than a sound like a, a low kind of mooing grunt sound. And as I went back and forth with it, it, I could change, you know, my cadence and it would change it a little bit as well. It was really interesting to, uh, to experience. And then of course I had a sighting in 2012 with me and my buddies up in Clearfield County, uh, which scared me so bad. I almost gave up the research and left the field. Um, uh, we were camping make a very long story short, we were camping and our, we had a repeat visitation to our campsite. We had put the fire out at something at one point had put the logs back on the fire and rekindled the fire. Uh, it was just a really intense night we had out there. It was crazy. So those things all bundled up, uh, you know, really give me a credence that this thing exists. I was out with Billy Willard one time out on the chestnut Ridge gray station. Billy got eye shine out there. And we had a rock thrown at us, a softball-sized rock that went right in between me and Billy. almost hit me right in the face. Mm. But, you know, you look at those things and say, well, those are some pretty impressive things that have happened. But you have to look at the time span upon which they happened. Right. You know, they, they didn't happen one after each other. These are things that have happened after years of, uh, of research. So yeah. uh, it makes me a little bit more confident that at least some of these things weren't just in my head. You know, and sure. I've experienced, I've been fortunate enough to experience these things with more than one person. So with Tim Cassidy and I in the Chestnut Ridge where we had the infrasound, uh, my research partner, Ernie Delp, uh, Chuck and Catherine Holderby, they were with me when we got the sound file. And Dustin and Ray, uh, my, my best friends, some of my best friends, they were on the ridge with, or out in the Keystone, out in Clearfield County, Clearfield County with us that night. We had our experience, which is just a crow's fly from the Allegheny National Forest, where, interesting enough, I learned a couple years later that there was another gentleman that was camping out there and had experienced the same thing with something rekindling his fire. Interesting. Uh, so it, it's it's different. You know, th that's not something that I was familiar with in Bigfoot activity, right? But, you know, it kind of makes sense, depending on so, how long do you think watching us. Do you think they're mimicking us? I think so. But I think if you, uh, you how to say this without sounding crazy, uh, you know, you hear the reports of, you know, vocalizations and these things being able to mimic other animals and other sounds like they, they definitely have some sort of an intelligence to be able to do that. I mean, we, you know, we mimic, yep. you know, we mock and we, uh, we try to replicate just, Sometimes out of humor, sometimes out of curiosity, we do it and we're trying to vocalize to them. So perhaps it will, you know, take that opportunity to kind of do the same thing in its behavior, mimic what it sees us do. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Barb Sandy asked, am I from uh, Western New York Bigfoot? No, no, I am not. Uh, Joe, I, Joe has been invited on my team, and uh, I just have a very quiet acting team of people that I take out in the woods with me 
<clears throat> you know, a g group of guys. It's not like we have anything official. It's not like an organization. Yeah. Um, I'm over on the eastern part of New York. In fact, I'm, you know, uh, literally maybe 15, 20 minutes to the Vermont border. Um, so I'm not not all that far. I'm in the, in the most east. Uh, actually, in the county I live in borders with Vermont. So. Um, Look, now, Sean, I, I, I want to... I wanted to ask a couple. I want to hit a couple yeah. of questions on Sean that, while it's fresh mm -hmm. in my mind, we're talking about. Um, I don't know if you were aware of the uh, 2011 where something uh, Jeff Thomas was with our group, as was uh, Melissa Hovey and Wayne Larson. They were, uh, you know, they were all we were all camped out, and it had been raining, and we were collecting birch all day long because birch will burn regardless if it's wet or dry, and um, at some point in the night, about 1.30, I'd say, I got up to use a tree, and that's when I saw my five-and-a-half-foot juvenile. Just as soon as I got out of the tent, it took off. The next morning, Jeff had found a birch log behind his Jeep that was not there the evening previously because he went out to his Jeep at 11 o'clock, and he would have tripped over. So, um, you know, uh, what can I, I say? Remember I remember Jeff telling that story when he was speaking at Mothman, the Mothman festival a few years back. And, you know, again, you know, to go to your question, do they mimic, it would be hard to think they wouldn't, but we don't know, but it would be hard to think they wouldn't. Right. Well, uh, would not fire, uh, watching a fire burn, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be entertainment for them? Be something out of the ordinary, and maybe they I like watching it. Watching the people around the fire. Let's they may be. Yeah. yeah. They're, uh, you know, we congregate around it. We tell stories. We laugh. Right. You know, some folks sing. You know, it is a, a center of uh, entertainment for us as much as it's, you know, warmth or light. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it could, you know, definitely see that as how we see it, Chris. Why not? Interesting. Uh, but, you know, if you had the, you know, birch tree you know, move behind the Jeep and, you know, other situations where, you know, things have happened and replication. I mean, you gather enough data over time, we could say that, you know, we could make a good case for it. Right. And uh, truthfully, the, the sighting I had in 2011, it was definitely watching us at the campfire. I walked out to my car, you know, quietly and just get batteries and shine my light. And there it is. And, you know, what can I say more about it? It just, um, <laughs> it was watching because the, it was October, leaves had fallen. You know, it, it can look right over to where that fire was, no problem. So yeah, I think you know, it's uh, a very fascinating uh, facet that they will watch us, and at times they will mimic us. I think that they, it's almost like a game to them. Um, mm -hmm. So I find it very curious about, putting the logs on the fire it sounds like to me they were watching you guys putting logs on the fire and you know mm. you guys left boom, plop one there imitation yeah I and mean, yeah. it was just funny how it happened because we were in the tent we we're just lying there we heard something walking around the campsite and you know the the bipedal heavy walking and i see dustin's little cell phone light pop on i he goes you hear that i said yeah we're lying there a little bit and all of a sudden, we start seeing this orange glow from outside the tent. And Dustin gets out, and that, there's the fire. It was rekindled. So definitely a different experience. Never expected that to happen. Expe and it kept coming back that night. We had gotten it uh, to run off when I jumped out of the tent. Dustin was still out there. I jumped out of the tent. It ran up the hillside. And then you could hear it kind of go around the perimeter of the, of the little meadow we were in. And I had called, I ran to the center of the, the field because the only place you get service, the only place out there, you could get like a bar to a service. <laughs> so I called Carrie Rupert, you know, her husband, Dave is a good friend of mine, a researcher. And he and Ryan Cavaline weren't far from the area. So I called them. They came out with us for a while. You know, we were out there to get elicit Sasquatch activity. We weren't going to do it that night. We were going to start the next morning, early in the morning. Uh, and uh, 
you know, it happened. And so they managed to build my confidence up and to get us to stay out there. And then they left. And about a half hour after they left, here it comes again. Walking through the campsite. <coughs> so as we're trying to decipher what's going on, you know, Dustin had his gun. I told Gus, Dustin to shoot it because you could see it standing from the moonlight in the tree line. I said, just, I said, shoot the damn thing. But I'm tired of it messing with us. I've given it so many warnings. Hey, if you're a person, you know, identify yourself, get out here, show us who you are and, you know, we'll get this over with. And it did nothing to the verbal warnings, you know? Uh, and so Dustin's like, I can't shoot it. I don't know what the hell it is. I'm not going to shoot it. And I was really laying the pressure on him to, to shoot the damn thing. And uh, we couldn't. So as the three of us got together, we decided we were going to bluff charge it. Right. So we, three of us ran towards the tree line and it ran off. But then we got back in the tent and it started to rain. So I figured, well, it's raining, you know, nothing's going to bother us. And sure enough, nothing bothered us for the rest of the night. But as soon as daylight hit, I think it was like five 30, we packed everything up into, we had a rubber made tote there. We threw everything in that Rubbermaid tote. I think we broke the tent and our fat asses hauled out of there like you wouldn't believe. And uh, <laughs> I called my wife. I called my wife on the way home and I said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I, uh, whatever happened to us out here last night, it scared the hell out of me. Uh, I didn't feel like it was going to hurt us. But just the fact that we had an experience, the fact that it kept coming back and that it wasn't responding to any of our, you know, our, you know, identify yourself threats to harm. Right. Uh really really shook me and it took me a long time to get over that i didn't go back out to that spot until 2016 so it took me four years to go back out to uh that area because it messed me up so bad and i almost quit the field in general i didn't want to do it anymore because i think at that point in time i was still kind of i don't know what's the word i was still kind of doubtful that this thing exists right and i think we were we were that was very kind of it. <laughs> Keep us warm <laughs> out there in the meadow. Uh, you know, I was kind of maybe just naive to the fact that, you know, maybe I wasn't going to have anything else happen, that we've been doing this for so long, that this isn't real. I'm anymore. sorry, Sean. <laughs> you guys look a little cold, so let me put a log on the fire. Well, it did. It, it, I tell you what, that, <laughs> if it wasn't the warmth from the fire, it sure was from the urine in the trousers, you know, because that was a... Stunning well, you know, moment. that's kind of a, it's, it's kind of unnerving that uh, this creature, uh, or even if it was a person, uh, would return so many times in the general area where you were in the campsite. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, you know. It's like they weren't weren't frightened to come in there with you, you know. Yeah. And that's, that was what bothered me the most, Chris, was that it, it kept coming back. It didn't respond to any kind of threat of right. uh, threat of harm. And if I was, I think it would have been a lot different if I was by myself too. That probably would have changed the whole conditioning of the, uh, I may have just left, left everything there and just got the hell out of Dodge. But I was there with my buddy, Dustin, who's military trained my, you know, brother Ray, who's a big son of a gun. He's like six, four. 350 is a big guy himself. Uh, so, you know, when you're there with people, you feel a little bit more like backed up and supported, it's but we a were all better with backup. Scared. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were all scared. In fact, it, we did an episode of Sasquatch experience uh, on it. I think it was our 16th episode of relaunching it. And I actually had them come on and tell their story for the first time. Cause they've never talked right. about it publicly outside of, because you know, you, me being the only one telling the story is not quite fair because I wasn't the only one that experienced it. You're only getting the story from my point of view, how I experienced it. Right. Uh, and I wanted them to be able to share in case I either embellish something or they experienced something I didn't experience. And the s sad thing is it's pretty, I don't want to say it's eidetic, but it's pretty very similar in the reaccounts. Now, Ray was uh, sleeping through a little bit more of it than the rest of us were. So he didn't experience quite as much, but, um, you know, definitely had an experience out there. And then, you know, to be frank, it's an area that had a lot of Bigfoot, ex uh, Bigfoot activity to begin with. That's why we chose that place. But in a million years, a million years, I never would have expected to have uh, an encounter of my own out there because I had a lot of doubt up in that time. 
a lot of doubt rather this was uh you know real or not i had been doing the research for a while we were doing the podcast like candy uh it was you know we it was getting oversaturated and i think you know just experiencing that it just frightened the hell out of me chris and i wanted to quit i really did i wanted to quit and get away from it which is a shame because it's something I love. I love this research. I met a lot of good people in it. Steve, you, we have a lot of friends, Steve, that I've met through this. They're like family. And like, I was willing to give all that up because of that experience. That's, that was the bothersome part. It, it just frightened me. I still get emotional thinking about it. Really. I, it, it piques me because I don't like going back to remember how I felt at that yeah. point in time. This is kind of like that old saying, be careful what you wish for. You know? Yeah, it really when, was. When you right? actually get that experience that you've been longing for, it may not be as pleasant as what you know you may have hoped. <laughs> but uh, Well, then you have the you have the experience and then you know you talk about it and everybody and their brother wants to give an opinion or you know right. what it was. Yeah. And that's great. That's fine. Yeah. That's why we share these stories. But yeah. I'm never gonna be able to convey the feeling I had that evening because like, I don't know if words could just fully define how I felt, you know, it's really more of a feeling. And I think if folks, if you experience something, there's like a little sense of wonder in there and a little sense of like, you're taken aback. And then there's a little fear. And in my part, there was a little fear. So it was different. And it's just hard to, hard to explain. And I don't know why, but I feel like it's given me a much better BS detector when I go to talk to a witness who has had an encounter. There's just something about it that, you know, like, you know, you can't replicate that level of, you know, you can't replicate that. You can't fake that, that feeling. You really can't. And uh, you see it over and over in people. Yeah, we were talking about that before, Sean. Like when somebody says that when they first saw this Bigfoot, they felt relief and no no fear whatsoever, and they were happy or something. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. You see, you're seeing a wild animal, something that's not supposed to exist, and it's huge, and you have no fear? So, well, it's just going to walk up there? to your back door and knock and ask for garlic. That's what it's going to be yeah, next. Exactly. <laughs> Because, you know, so, people that have no people that have no, you know, fear of these things, I think it's a little and again, I don't want to make this thing out to be a monster because that's that's not right. what I'm saying. But I think with anything wild, you should have a little bit of respect and fear of what could potentially yes. happen. Like to yes. be ignorant and to think this thing's gonna be, you know, Harry Henderson, it's just not gonna happen. And it it bothers me when people are so nonchalant about it because we really shouldn't be that thing. Even if it, not maybe as a, you know, Lee, you know, Lee three PO, I don't think Sasquatch is wild animal human. Well, still even a, a, a human, a primitive human, you should be a little afraid of. I'm afraid of some real, you know, normal humans. And, well, and you see, I, I would digress because I've seen two of them and they look nothing like a human, you know, uh, the, the full body hair, the height, the weight, the lack of a neck, it's foot, it's foot. Um, anatomy should tell you anybody that it, this is not a human. It has a mid tarsal break, doesn't have an arch. There are so many physical differentiations that you can't have the same DNA as a human. Now, is it another type of hominin? Perhaps. But until we have the DNA, we really don't know. Well, we're definitely but, dealing with something that has some intelligence i think we could Absolutely. all at least agree that there's intelligence yeah. involved and uh As to the all, level yeah. of that intelligence right that's that's yeah. what's to be determined but when you're talking about instinct uh which is more of a i don't know what did you think instinct's not really an emotion it's a biological hardwiring of your your senses right uh that's not necessarily related to intelligence that's instinctual so perhaps some of the things that we experience when we run into these things is just the Bigfoot's instinct taking over. Perhaps the way we feel when we run into this thing is something that's built into our DNA through maybe experiences we've had through the years that 
you know, just it's a natural, natural reaction. I don't know. So that's that's bothering me a little bit. <clears throat> Kaiju Ninja asked the question, if you kill one, would it be considered murder? Now, here is a very interesting thing. Um, obviously, if it is not a homo sapien. And the answer to that would be no, even if they make a law up right afterwards saying it's illegal to kill one. Um, unless, of course, you're in the three communities in the United States that makes it illegal to shoot, trap, or harass a Sasquatch, such as uh, the village of Whitehall, New York, Skamania County, Washington, such as that. But no, the, the, even if it turned out to be um, related to us, like really close to us, and they would give it a name of homo something or other. It would not be considered murder because the law is not on the books. And you can't go back. Once that law is played, if the shooting occurs in March and then in April they they do a protective law, they can't go back and charge you for what happened in March using a law that was passed in April. That's it's not just retroactive. Simple, right. It's, well, it's simple legality. Yeah, but, the, you know, it is like a, if you look at it through the uh, the Buddhist philosophy, you know, anything that you take its life is intentionally is murder. You know, yep. when you uh, ate that hamburger, you know, the other day. Yes. Technically, you're a murderer because uh, you're responsible for taking that animal's life so you could consume it. But now, sure, I'm not a vegan, so uh, you know, hey, I eat meat. Me too. I love a nice but, steak and a nice burger. <laughs> you know, more realistically. <laughs> You know, the moralistic <laughs> part of it is a lot different than the legality, right? So Correct. That, right. that's that's where right. that's where you gotta delineate the the feelings. Like I don't know if right. I would wanna be the one that pulled the trigger on one, but I know that we need proof, you know, so it, maybe it depends on my mood that day. You know, maybe it depends on how I'm feeling. Maybe if I have a reaction like I had in Clearfield and I had the gun, maybe I would have popped it. You know, there's a lot of in the moment, you know, a lot of in the moment scenarios that you just can't really think of until you're in it. And that's going to make the difference. Like, I think maybe for all, I don't want to kill one. I really don't. But we know, we know it's going to take a body to prove it. And so many people are going to love you and so many people are going to hate you if you're the first yeah. one to bag it. Correct. That, that that's the the trick or you can be like rick dyer and find them the bodies all over in the woods. yes he's got all kinds sure. of sure put him in a put him in a uh ken moore freezer <coughs> yeah. or I'm surprised you know, he doesn't have his own warehouse of bigfoot bodies he probably <laughs> he probably does he probably does uh, don't get mad rick we love you it's okay yeah. he got him even at though his, uh, got him at a yeah. closeout sale now, even be, even though he did sound like a, even though he did sound like a manure salesman with a mouth full of samples, so. Uh, <laughs> well. Uh, where were we? Ah. I believe him. I believe him. I do. I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> there was hands up in the air and everything. There, you were. You were really com selling that yes. one, Chris. You know, remember the uh, remember the whole skit we used to do with the teacher. We have a bigfoot researcher who said oh, bigfoot yeah. was his teacher. Remember that one, yeah. Sean? No, I don't. <laughs> Refresh me, uh, Tom. If you Cantrell, always said bigfoot was his teacher, and it was coming to him in his oh, dreams. Okay, and okay. So me and, and and Jeff got into this whole thing of teacher Ooh. says, you know. And it'd be really funny because, you know, with, with this thing, it teacher says, never shoot at the Sasquatch. It's not nice. You know, stuff like, <laughs> you know, we, we could have a whole day with that in the sound bar. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. You know, you um, have, you, that's dangerous thoughts, you know, and, and I, yeah. I, I'm always careful because I try to be a lot more respectful than I used to be when I was a younger man and a little bit more ignorant and, had verbal diarrhea sometimes that maybe I, oh, yeah, you know, I've yeah. grown older. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. You want to, yeah. yeah. You want a PB and J sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So, but it's just dangerous thought that, you know, we let these yeah. people go unchecked uh, and they can just go out and, and freedom of speech. I get it. But, you know, at some point it's just so detrimental to the legitimate research. And that, that's the yeah. point I try to convey when I'm talking. About it. It does, I don't care what somebody believes. What I care is when they go out and they spew it like it's fact and it takes away any credibility I also have because now I'm lumped in with this idiot. Sure. You know, now, yeah. because just because you look for Bigfoot, just because you're on the search too, Steve, you're just like the guy that has it whispering it to him, you know, telling yeah. him that you've got the thoughts in your head. And that's, that's the part that really, really ticks me off, really gets me, me going. And so when I, I don't go after people, but when I talk about these scenarios and I get a little defensive or upset about it, it's because you, you know, some of us that have been doing this for over 20 years, you know, it, cuts us off at the knees every time something happens you get a good audience you get people that want to listen and then you have you know you have somebody that stands up in the middle of a uh a conference or a, a speaking engagement you're at and tells you she's a twenty five thousand year old extraterrestrial and bigfoot is her errand boy oh my lord have you has that actually happened yeah, to you that happened to me a, a bill uh, <laughs> agents of the unknown is in the chat he was at that event with me, and the lady stands up at the end. It was myself, Amy Boo, and, uh, you know, she says she's a 25,000-year-old extraterrestrial, and Bigfoot is her, you know, essentially errand boy. All right. Very cool. And then, of course, any credibility we had tried to build up through that whole presentation and that whole night, oh, wow. and just wow. the audience just, you know, it just got pissed away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was there. OMG. Yeah, see? Yeah. Oh, wow. I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Guess what? He says, you know what? Uh, if you can hit me up on Facebook or on email, I would love to see the recording of that. <laughs> I wonder if you could see any of our faces, like uh, myself or Amy's <laughs> face when that lady gets up. Because I was really holding it in to not be, you know, ignorant because this woman. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to get up in front of all those people courage or mental oh. illness i guess i don't know but i'm so i crazy. try to be polite and i i try to show love and respect to everybody but if somebody did that to me sean i believe i would just tell her straight out lady you're crazy you are I, crazy it was well, I, we all felt it and i it just took the air i think right out of the room well, you know, I, I want to welcome Joe K to the show. I don't think we've seen him before, but well, welcome. Joe. And, and I, you know what? Th these are statements that are safe to say here. Uh, you can see that in some chat rooms, and, and you will get excoriated uh, for saying there's no proof. Hey, I, you know, the proof has been subjective over the last God knows how many years now. So I, I, I don't disagree with you. I feel that there is some stuff worthy of... It taking a look at my science but in, in reality um you know e you know even the film is not evidence it's subjective um i yeah. know daniel weeks is saying that the pg film again it's subjective um uh, you know uh as far as experts you know i don't claim necessarily to be an expert on sasquatch but the term expert is a frame of reference. In other words, I've been a researcher for 25 years, and if a newspaper says, oh, we talked to an expert, well, that's because they haven't been doing the research for 25 years. And I always yeah. use that example. If, you know, okay, you have a broken pipe at home, you call an expert a plumber. So the, the plumber is an expert, no, no doubt, right? But if you put that plumber in a convention of other plumbers, is he an expert? Well, no. So amongst the researchers, we are not experts. Amongst the lay people, the people who have no knowledge of this or are drive-bys to this or enthusiasts, we are the experts based on years behind us. Some are good experts. Some are pretty, some are pretty piss poor <laughs> experts. And it's just a frame of reference. It's not a title. Understand yeah. that. So no, you may, I'll get, I'll, I'll get know, off my so, soapbox. I think you said that perfectly. And I think, you know, to Joe in the chat, you know, those questions and statements are, are valid. 
depending on your point of view. Uh, you know, to yeah. some people, the evidence is apparent. To, I, I can tell you, as somebody that's been in this for over 20 years, and I think, Steve, well, we, the evidence isn't good enough. And that's where we have to work to be better. The Agreed. evidence isn't good enough. And, and that's why we like having people like Ben Radford and Kenny Biddle on the show. Sure. Because those are the guys that will tell us what uh, we want. And yes, Joe, we, we get that and we're glad you love the subject. And, you know, truthfully, uh, you know, talking to Ben Radford, to Joe Nickel, um, to, um, uh, to uh, Kenny Biddle, they love the topic too. They just sit in a different stance on it. You know, and that's, you know, uh, Joe Nickel and I had the greatest conversation Oh, probably about 10 years ago, I ran into him at the Chautauqua Lake Bigfoot Expo with a year Bob Gimlin came up. And, uh, you know, Joe even said to me afterwards, because I just got done talking to Bob Gimlin, and he goes, it's really hard to think he's a hoaxer or trying to do anything. It's really, so he had to, you know, he really, you could see he was really, you know, you know, Bob didn't show him any disrespect and, and talk to him very respectfully and tell, told him his story. And that was that. Bob's a very charming person. Right. He really is a very down to earth, salt of the earth, you know, sweet older man. He yeah. really is. And I don't think you could have a, a heart and go after him and be, uh, you know, excruciatingly ignorant to him. And, uh, but that's also dangerous. <laughs> oh, here's another. And, uh, and you know what? I, I love new folks because they have some great questions. So, Joe K., welcome to the show. Hopefully, you'll subscribe and visit us, uh, you know, every week because you're asking some great questions. Was finding Bigfoot show good or bad for the Bigfoot community? And I'll let, you know, I'll let all of you answer, you know, in your own turn, too, because I want to. But I'll say this. With every positive, you have to take some negative. A lot of people thought, oh, you know, let me bang on a tree a little bit. And, you know, oh, that's Bigfoot back at us. Or, you know, you know, you know screaming and stuff like that. That's not what we do. Um, that was the stuff they can put on air and that they edited to make it look flashy and exciting. Um but the cool thing about it is, and, and you know, I, I know what Dyer had said, but I know after the first season, uh, there was a lot of complaints about the way the show was edited. And they, as the whole foursome said, if you continue to operate the editing this way, we are walking off the show. There will be no season two. So that's why from season two, it was a little bit different than the first season. I do know because I, I helped uh, get some witnesses and scout a couple of locations for, uh, you know, the, the show Finding Bigfoot for a, at least two or three episodes. Um, and I do know, especially that they try to do research as much as they can. Of course, they're against the clock. You know, that people are getting paid. People got to do stuff. And they have very limited time. Hey, we need to wrap this shoot by Thursday, and then we're off to the next site. So they, you know, but they do their best with what they can. At least, you know, I was out in the woods, and it was kind of funny because in the one episode where they looked at the Vermont Trail Cam photo, that uh, that was the Mother Bigfoot episode. Yeah. Uh, Cliff went out on his own, and I was actually out there with him for a little while. So yes, they they try to. Um, they uh, definitely try to, um, what are you doing, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> That's really loud. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, you're my good. Um, so anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, but the one thing it did, and let me just Answer. Then go back to the question: Was was it good or bad? Yes, it had that negative effect. They think Bigfoot researchers just knocking trees, screaming a little bit, and some crazy pranks like let's shoot up some fireworks or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, but the positive side is it did not make Bigfoot a four-letter word anymore. People were more open to talk about it, yeah. you know, because it's being broadcast every week to people's millions of homes. So. 
Well, uh, Chris, you want to go next, and then we'll go to Sean. Yeah, well, I, I just think uh, the show brought awareness. You know, it brought awareness to the subject, and that's good. It, it, it put it out there and let everybody know that, hey, this is a mainstream thing, and, uh, you know, if you've seen something, say something. Don't, you don't have to hide it, and a lot of people were, were able to come forward and say, you know, about 10 years ago, I was hunting, and I seen something that I just can't explain, you know. But they before they'd been reluctant to talk about it, so it, it brought some awareness, and, and I think that was good about it. But you know, the, as far as being a research uh, model, no, you know, I know, you know, they they go out, they would go out in the woods in different locations, and you know, you know tap the and, tree. Oh yeah, okay, we can say there's a squatch in these woods, and then that's it. They're <laughs> off to another state. You know, that that's that's totally fine, but. Uh, and I just want to throw this out there. We're going to have a question, another question from Joe K. And I want to thank him. He just actually donated to uh, our channel. So he's thank enjoying you. the show. And Appreciate it, bud. Thank you much. Um, Sean, you? Uh, just like, you know, Chris said, and you said, you know, it brought awareness to something, gave it a little bit more uh, of a, uh, a positive light, right? It wasn't looked at more of like a sideshow anymore. Uh, I think a lot of us also bended from it in an ancillary way that maybe we weren't on the finding Bigfoot show, but definitely the conversation of Bigfoot was happening a lot more. And then in our various areas, people realized that, Hey, I have my own local expert. Let's talk to this person. And then some of us are getting, you know, speaking engagements and stuff. So it's interesting to see how it kind of benefited everybody in the community that was worth benefiting. Uh, it was entertainment hands down. Right. I used to call the show probably never finding Bigfoot because it had to go on to the next show over and over and over again. I think what 10 seasons is a long time. 10 seasons yeah. is, a, is a lot of TV, but did it show us in a, always a serious light? No, no, it didn't. And uh, you know, the absolute certainty, you know, that some of us have, when we go out there and squatches or Bigfoots and, you know, saying that definitively they're there. I think it's, uh, you know, it's just foolish, but yep. again, that's TV and it's ratings. That's what they want. So that's what you do. Oh. And that was the one good point Dyer made today was, you know, uh, TV shows are a whole other, you know, it's almost like he's been listening to my shows, you know, cause I've said the same thing it is that TV shows are one thing because they need to keep that audience coming back week to week versus your documentaries where they try to get to the bones of things. Um, Discovery uh, doesn't care if they find Bigfoot. Discovery cares how much Tide's going to pay them to right. run commercials th during yeah. during that yeah. TV show. Yeah. Um, and Joe's next question, uh, great show, and we appreciate, again, the donation. Uh, when do you think Todd Standing will pull his next hoax video? I, uh, I, I, I can't tell you. I, I don't know. Um, you never know with him. He's very unpredictable. He's very secretive. Um, so it's, it's really hard to say when, you know, he's actually more of a challenge than Dyer is to tell you the truth. Um, Cause he has a way of getting some people to think he's credible. Well, and because he, he, he studied the topic. Yeah. And, uh, that's that when you can get someone like him to start getting people like, you know, Les Stroud and, and others to, you know, lend themselves, you know, to you and try to, you know, increase your own credibility. That's, that gets a little dangerous for people because now, like, they see you with Survivor Man. They obviously think he knows what he's doing when he's out in the woods. Uh, you know, just adds a little bit more credibility to the person. And as we talked before we went on the air here, I told you one of the more dangerous things that's happening in the field is how people can go out and say whatever they want to unvetted, and some people grab it and hold it to the gospel. You know, sure. it's, and there's not a lot of critical thought anymore, and that's definitely something that, I, we'll never change because it's something we've battled forever. It's just, you know, something we have to combat when we run into it the best we can. That's what, that's what gets dangerous. So people like Todd standing continue to get away with what they get away with because some of you are gullible. That's just how it is. Some of you will believe anything. And I, I really think that, you know, they picked, um, standing because he was a Canadian and so is Lush Stroud. I, I don't okay. think of any any other reason why 
because obviously they saw what was said about him online. You know, well, I don't know reserved, unless you're even, under unless you're under a rock. <laughs> I think Les did did say a, a small disclaimer about some of Standing's Correct. evidence about some people have questioned. You know, it was something of that nature. It was just to let everybody know that you know, some people might don't feel real good about his evidence. And I, and I forget the term, uh, and, and talking with, with uh, uh, Jeff Meldrum about it, I, it was some term he used. I forgot what he, you know, you know, it's, yeah, he goes, I did have something happen to me that could have been a Bigfoot experience when I was with them, uh, you know, but, you know, Todd took us there, but even, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you know, if you, you cast the net in the ocean, you, you're bound to catch something some at some point in time. You know, or something similar to that effect. It wasn't that exact paraphrase, but it was a similar type of analogy. Um, you know, and so there's no no doubt in my mind that he is very suspect of a lot of, of Todd's things. So, but as a scientist, he is the the guy who kind of just you know plays. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to lower myself to you know trying to. I'm just going to put out what's true and let the rest slide by. And you know, that's his, his prerogative. And, sure, you know, we, we could be doing that, too, if we wanted to. We could be, and there's a lot of channels out there. They talk about Bigfoot, but they don't talk about the bad stuff. So. Well, a lot of people today, though, don't have the history that some of us do with it. Right. You know, yeah. let's be honest. You know, some of these folks that are not, not talking crap on anybody, they just haven't ex haven't had the experiences some of us have had. And. You know, especially we hit this field, Steve, at the time where the internet was coming to fruition. Bigfoot websites started popping up. YouTube started popping up. Videos were coming out. You know, we we were really getting a lot of information thrown at us from many different avenues. And there were a lot less of us back then going through it. And hell, sure. we couldn't get along back then with each other about things. So that hasn't, they haven't been able to get along since they've started this research. But uh, you know, with the advent of the Internet and all this information flying at us, you know, we were able to start using the Internet as a good tool and help us start going through and debunking or, uh, you know, dispelling a lot of this stuff that was coming at us. I think the thing that's funny is we see all these Bigfoot videos that have come out since Patterson Gimlin and they've all been worse. Yeah. And the days of today's technology and what we have, everything has been worse than the Patterson film. So we question the Patterson. I, I don't know how somebody could look at the Patterson film and say it's a hoax and then look at one of these videos that are out on YouTube and be so die hard that that's a legitimate thing. I don't understand it. Right. And, and look at the dichotomy of a, of a Rick Dyer who goes on the show and says, well, Bob Hieronymus passed the lie detector test. And then we talk a little bit later on and he makes the statement Lie detectors aren't admissible in court, aren't they, Steve? So there, there you have it. And I, I kind of purposely set him up to make that, you know, dichotomy there to, you know, contradict himself. Um, you know, he, he his his strongest uh, his strongest piece is that oh, Bob Hieronymus passed the lie detector test, but then in in summation, he says, why aren't they admissible in court? Because they're not accurate. Listen, there are serial killers time. that could pass right. a lie detector test too. Exactly, exactly. You, know, you just and have I, to be a sociopath to pass it. That's well, it. the other thing too is, and I made this this uh, analogy as well. You know, he was like, "Why well, can't? Why doesn't Bob Gimlin take the test? Because it doesn't matter." And he says, "Because it doesn't matter. Because nobody. It doesn't matter because he's been telling this story for so long that if he gets on a lie detector test." It's going to come out to be truth, regardless if it's a lie or not. Yeah, yeah and I think because, people forget that, right? And that is just, you know, hey, hey, listen, he can say what he wants, but I'm the guy who studies this. I'm the guy whose profession is part of a polygraph exam. Sometimes, not that I've ever given one, but I know some of the basics. I'm a trained forensic interviewer, and um, you know, so we'll see. Uh, you know, only time will tell. Everything, yeah. you know, everything is. <clears throat> um, 
You got to work with that guy on uh, the Nat Geo uh, Loch Ness special too. Yes, David Bird was his name. David and, Bird. Okay. Yeah, and he was a uh, great guy. He uh, he actually was born in Nambia, in Africa. For those who don't yeah. know, um, your, your atlas is folks. Yeah, thirty four years with Scotland Yard. And then when he was done with that, he went to Canada and went to this Canadian training academy for polygraphy. And he has called out all over Europe to administer lie detectors. As and actually, uh, about two months previous to coming on the Nat Geo special, he had actually given a lie detector test to an alleged serial killer in Belgium. So that's how, you know, you know, wanted this guy is. So it's really top notch guy. And we had a long talk about forensic interviewing and all that stuff. And I got to, I got the, the gist on, you know, how he explains the polygraph exam. And I'll tell you what, he, he says, you know, he is explaining this. He, he says, um, and he just threw out this question that caused me to, to trip up. And that's how good he is at putting people, you know, under the gun. Um, you know, wow. and it was, it was like, you know, have you, and it was like, have you, you know, when you were married, have you ever thought of another woman? And that was back when it was like, wow, that is a really sweaty question. Yeah. What um, do you say? Yeah, never. You say that? No, never. never. I've never uh, thought about another woman while I'm married, yeah. you know, <laughs> that happens. It's, it's natural. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, 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 tell you about throwing, you know, he knew the right question to throw at people just to get them off kilter to see how a lie detector test can work. And uh, so just understand that, uh, you know, from forensic interviewing, uh, I, I know the fact that uh, it doesn't work on, on people if you're not, you know, like, for example, Chris can say, well, I, I, I know what the forensic interview is, and I would pass that in a heartbeat. Well, you're not guilty of anything I'm going after you for, so of course you would, right? But when you have this crime in the back of your head or this deed in the back of your head, and you get sat down and, and put, as long as you're not a sociopath, which I think tonight really shined through with a particular person. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, you will break. Them. Yeah. And that's the scary part. Like with, with people like sociopaths, right? The, the guilt has no effect. And, on and Joe, Joe's paying for quite, you don't have to pay for questions, Joe, but I, <laughs> oh, we appreciate yeah. that. We appreciate that. I've ever talked to Ken Walker, the taxidermist. I have not. Um, I don't know if Ken Walker is. Is that um, the one that worked with Todd Standing? Well, the one who stole the area off of, I believe. Well, yeah. I was trying to be polite. <laughs> yep. yep. Call it, tell it like you see it, Steve. Can't, can't say I have, but I would love, <laughs> I would love to talk to him. If you can put us in contact, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um. So. Um, How much is the question cost? Five ninety nine. <laughs> they, they don't they know he's he's being generous and um, that's why i was like you don't have to pay for questions but we appreciate the tip but <clears throat> so up now now we're talking uh, the chat has gone wild with you know you know barb you must have a crush on an actor who <laughs> Um, um, time listeners can ask for free. I think about Lisa. <laughs> so yeah, we, we've started. You know, a I'm, whole, a, we've I'm started a Real a Housewives of Beverly Hills fan, so I appreciate that. Yes, and now we're the Real Housewives of Squatched them or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Them. That would be a hell of a show. Yes. Imagine the significant others of people that are involved in this field and how they've been tortured over the years. Well, wasn't it, uh, what's his name from down in Florida? He had the wife swap show. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. And, um, yeah, that was, that was something else. <laughs> oh, and, and Kaiju, uh, Kaiju Ninja says, I would watch that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, what's he? Oh, there's there's Steve again out there whittling on his tree knocker. He's getting ready to knock a tree. <laughs> there he is, knocking on the tree. Love it. My wife could not care less about Bigfoot. No, she same. don't. She don't want to know if it's real or not. She don't want to know if it's out oh. there. She would rather remain, you know, uh, blissfully uh, oblivious to the knowledge of Bigfoot, whether it's real or not. She... Sorry about the glare, folks. <laughs> it's getting it's getting a little hot under the lid here. Well, they're either going to get it off your head or off my chin. So one or the other. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> So Ken Walker was the first person to talk to Justin at the shooting. He was in a documentary called Big Fur. Hmm, interesting. I've saw I've seen that. Uh, Big Fur. Interesting. I don't think it. I, I don't know. I think he takes taxidermied animals and makes like a Sasquatch out of it. If I'm, if I remember, if that's what I watched correctly. Very interesting. I wonder if that has anything to do with Todd Standing. Big fur doesn't sound appropriate. It's kind of like you know that peop the those people that take the deer asses and make them into ass squatches. Ass squatches. Ass squatches. They're terrible. It's a new one on me. I've seen a jackalope though. Yeah. A jackalope. Yeah. They yeah. they're more prevalent than you think. Or 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 the uh, bull balls on the uh, trailer hitch. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know that that used to be a common thing around here. I don't know. It's it's kind of went away though. I, I think it lost its appeal. It's kind of a fetish. I think why. some people like. Yeah. Why would you want to put a pair of? I don't know. Nuts on your truck? Truck nuts? nuts right? Is that what can't they were? imagine it? If you're gonna put them on your truck, drive like you got a pair. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and why would you put them in the back of the truck? Yeah. <laughs> truck nuts. I want people see me coming. <laughs> uh, brass balls yeah brass balls were a thing he made a patty oh okay yeah it I'm was he made a sasquatch that. out of uh out of uh animal skin I it's going to write that animal down. fur big fur documentary okay it's That's been a while be since the... i've seen it and i think it might be on youtube or it might be on tubi okay check it out Homework assignment, people. Yeah. <laughs> big fur. Big fur. Not big foot. Big fur. Big fur. Well, any speculation on uh, what Dyer's going to do next, Steve? Yep. That's what do you think? Yeah, it's going to another another hoax is brewing. Mm. You know, another hoax is brewing. I will so, take him at his word, though. I will. I will not believe him. No, and you shouldn't, and you shouldn't. The San Antonio Bigfoot thing, you remember where the people living in the tent took a picture? Behind the old Home yeah. Depot, yep. Yeah. Was he involved in that? Yes. I thought so. Okay, yeah. I have to go back a few years, folks, and think about the uh, <clears throat> think about these things. You know, the troll wanted me to ask him the tough questions. I did. I asked him questions that were tough. He made a claim. I asked a question, well, who's, who's the production company? Uh, 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 well, yeah. And then he realized that he messed up, that it wasn't the network that was sending him or the network approaching him. It was a production company. Yeah. So, you know, he likes to blow it up. Inflate things. Right, and he does, and he obviously doesn't understand is that once a video is uh, uh, it's completed, it needs to be sold to the production company, or it needs to be sold rather to the network. Yeah, they shop um, it around. They just have to shop it around. Um, they may have already done a sizzle reel with him, and somebody said, "Oh yeah, we'll buy it," but that's the actual methodology of how it happens. They just don't say, "Oh yeah, we we want to film with this guy." I, I did that. a sizzle. I did a sizzle reel with Butch Wachowski and uh, with God rest Lon his Strickler. Soul. Yeah, with Lon Strickler. That was a. The show was going to be called Cryptid Hunters. That's how they promoted it, and they shopped it around. It never went anywhere, uh, but it was fun to do. I, I had a lot of fun just being a part of that and seeing it go in a complete different direction. Than what the producers had in mind because they sat Butch, myself, and Lon. They let us sit down at a table. 
and the things we just started talking about and the conversation just went wild and they shot so much footage of us. Just, I wish they'd send that to us now, you know, Butch isn't with us anymore. So yeah, it'd have been nice to have, you know, have that, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun filming that I had a, had a lot of fun that day. Yeah. Uh, I remember, uh, I got sent in a sizzle reel with, uh, Ben Radford of all people. And uh, we, we and Fernando Moriere, a tracker. It was another crypto guy from Wisconsin. I forget his name, Jeff something or other. Um, I, that never went anywhere either. We actually filmed it in Kentucky, <laughs> of all places. <laughs> and and um, as I remember talking to Chris, and we we were we were going to meet up at the hotel, but there was a horrible ice storm that night. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, that you know, and it happens. I I don't even know what the name of that show was going to be. <laughs> uh, I've done probably about four sizzle reels, but the problem is, is a lot of times they don't want fact. They don't want to hear this is not real. This is possibly something else. They don't want to hear that. What they want to hear is, oh my gosh, what do we got? Ooh, look at that! Again, it's for a series, not a documentary. Yeah, because you go out in the woods with us and do a real investigation, it's boring. Right. Well, Nine times out of ten, it's boring. Yeah, that's like uh, why Finding Bigfoot had the little uh, controversy during season one because of the, the horse thermal, you know. Uh, Matt and, they, and all of them knew it was a horse. Right. But when the production company, when they put it together in editing, made it out to be like, <gasps> oh, we got to right. watch thermal, you know. They kind of left it open to interpretation when it was not. And Matt Matt came clean and said, hey, we knew specifically this was a horse. And he was so angry about yeah. that. Well, yeah, he I was, was mad about that. I don't blame him. Well, you know, some of them still have a reputation in the field they got to maintain, too. You know, you're still yeah. active, involved in the research. You don't want to throw away your credibility with the people that are actually involved with it. Because you have to work with this after all this shit's gone. Right after all that stuff said and gone and the TV shows are gone, you have a base that you've got to go back to and you, you have to answer to us or more so Steve any more than me. I, you know, just sit in the background with a baseball bat. I, I sit up front with the baseball bat. I just take him out of the knees every once in a while. That's what I do. Um, Cause there's just so much you got to go after anymore. That's the problem. You really got to pick it. Like you're just talking right. about that video that you debunked what last night or the night before. And it didn't take you long to do that, but you almost have to like have this stuff on, you know, instant recall to go after it all. Cause there's so much. And Lon Strickler posted a video at Phantoms and Monsters the other day uh, of a guy from Vermont that uh, to me, it's a guy in the suit, you know, his reaction isn't even genuine, but you know, people, some people gravitate to that. And, you know, honestly, when you're running this as a business, you got to get the clicks, right? You got to put the fantastic stuff up there with the boring stuff or nobody's going to read the real stuff. You know, to most people, when there's not a lot of extraneous uh, activity or over embellished details, it's not interesting. It's, it's boring. And so you put the sizzle in there to get them there for them to read the other stuff. That's why it's taken me so long to write my book. You know, because there's so much stuff that we could talk about that unless you're an insider, you probably wouldn't get some of the, you know, inside stuff. But in all the years that some things have happened that have been exciting, there's so many years nothing's happened and it's been boring. Now, you make up for that boredom with the people you're out in the field with, the conversation, the camaraderie, uh, you know, all the things associated with it. But when it comes down to the actual brass tacks of things that happen nine times out of ten, it's a quiet night. Silent. And that's the reality yeah, exactly. of uh, research, you know, Cajun Ninja. It's not the reality of Let's research. Take a look no, at the we bring that. We have to uh, make that known that it is sometimes a very boring and grueling uh, search. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> let me uh, let me let me show you to uh, uh, just one of the the debunkings uh, <laughs> that you know, as part of that video. Um, and of course, I was using the. Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization's video, which they inverted for whatever reason, uh, um, mm. which they shouldn't have. Mm. 
you're in you're a research organization why are you putting out stuff that's been altered mm -hmm. but anyway here's just part of that um, as the boat approaches there it is coming out from the clearing and into the other side of the brush and then there is a little shake of the camera now i don't know if that's intentional or was it done to uh add some effect like they were shot? exactly uh, did not know if it came out first as you're videotaping the shake would be right there but it's not so i don't know what it is it could have been just a boat wave but it just seems a little peculiar that there's a shake after it mr it just disappears and then there's the shake so maybe the guy was adjusting his position i don't know So the next thing I want to look at is the step count of the creature while it's in the clearing and doing some calculations. You know, to me, Chris, that looks like it's very deliberate walking. So what we did here is we took a blow up of uh, the unsub in the video and we took the height measurement of it using an arrow and then we copied that arrow, same size, and we hypothetically said this could be a 10 foot Sasquatch, 9 foot, 8 foot, 7 foot, 6 foot. And then what we did is we took copies of that same size arrow and laid them along the clearing to give us a rough estimate of how wide apart that clearing is. And it could be anywhere from 30 feet to 18 feet, depending on the height of the subject. Now, I think 10 foot and 9 foot is kind of extreme, but I wanted to put those numbers out there just to show the average step or average, you know, gait of the creature. And as we look, you know, if this is an 8 foot creature, then the, the clearing is only 24 feet wide, and that seems kind of reasonable. So if we look at, uh, by taking that number of steps, we can get an average step length by looking at the particular clearing, and then we can take that clearing size and knock it down to inches, and then put it into what the average step length it would be. And as you can see, for an 8-foot Sasquatch, it would be only 32 inches. For a 7-foot, only 28 inches. And for a human, only 24. Now understand, terrain can also have an impact on your average stride as well. However, the Patterson Gimlin film is in actuality uh, has a much larger gate at 51.74 inches, so almost 52 inches. If the Patterson Gimlin film is real, uh, that stride was a lot bigger than this. And one would think that, you know, an eight foot Sasquatch could do a little bit better than a 32 inch step when the average human step is 30 inches. And there you have it. And I would like to add, Steve, that uh, at the end of the trackway, when the creatures started picking up speed uh, on the Patterson-Gimlin film, those tracks were measured out at 65 inches, uh, the, 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 the width uh, of, the, of the step. Yeah. So when she started, or he, or whatever was shown in the video, started picking up speed, it went from 50-some inches to 65 inches between the sure. heel to the toe that's a bunch well here is uh we got a question is the original video on mountain man's channel no absolutely not the actual video was dropped on october 5th and uh i i know who it is i know the channel i know who it is the person and uh the interesting thing is i've asked that person twice now to reach out to me on the comments and both times those comments have been deleted. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was, and so what I did was, is I emailed the guy at work because I have his work email address. <laughs> so I'll see if he answers that. So uh, that well, should yeah. answer that question. But you've no, reached out. I mean, you've done what we what what you could do. You have reached out if if you don't want to get back with you. Now Joe K. Joe K. Makes a great point. Why was it? Um, filming in that particular area so i'm going to pull up this graphic that's part of the video um which actually will show the boat wake so there you have it i'm going to bring that up as you can see the the predictive cameraman is what i call it yeah um it's it's facing to the port as it's first going and then slowly it goes to center. And then as the boat crosses the threshold of the clearing, the camera moves to the starboard side 
all before the creature makes its appear, the unsub makes its appearance. Now, here's a very other interesting thing. If you look right here, so that's, the, that's the boat wake. So it yeah. had come from right there. Now, somebody had asked uh, or made a statement earlier or on the, the uh, original video was, I don't think a person would be able to get that close to the, the edge there, all this wonderful stuff. But this uh, the video you've seen from the RMSO is edited, so it's been cut short. I'm not sure about the Mountain Man one either, but uh, the, the channel that, uh, the original channel is the unedited version, and he actually um, comes with audio. Yeah. with audio, comes really close to that shoreline. So there it is within 20, 30 feet. If you look off to the left, that's even closer. That may be like 20 feet, if that. Looks very shallow. Somebody could get in the boat, walk onto the land, vice versa. So to me, um, you know, it's very clear what all this is. I think the way it walks is very deliberate and trying. Uh, well, the, the reason briefly why I, that you can see it. Yeah, the reason why I put those sounds in there was so people could underhear the. Um, it wasn't walking at a cadence, like you see the PG film. Everybody's trying to say, "Oh, this thing looks like the PG film." It looks nothing no. like it. The PG film was boom, boom, boom. Yeah. It looks like steps. someone trying to walk like a Sasquatch across. Yeah, correct. And like if you look, it <laughs> almost looks like he's looking down. It looks like it's looking down at his feet as he's trying to move across that in some instances. Right. And uh, I, I'm not necessarily sure what that question is. Is there a pattern of filming in this manner? Um, right. I agree. It's very convenient that it appears in the clearing just at the right time and distance. Even more so is the audio in the video where he's saying, oh, you know, so-and-so, you wanted to see the lake? Well, here's the lake. And, you know, there's your excuse why he was filming. But why did he, why did he abruptly end the filming? Why didn't he add some more to it? And that's always the thing. Yeah. You know, there's and, never and, enough. And, and you're right, the arm movements were off. It also kind of took a very small step, almost like, oh, oh, so. Yeah. It's hard to get excited about this stuff anymore, and this is why. <laughs> because you just the mind instantly goes to, well, how can we debunk this? And I, I think, Steve, I think it's very healthy yeah. to have that. Now, I, I know some people are saying uh, this, this is a current, it's not a current. The boat actually makes the turn uh, and goes basically right back to where you see that current. It's not a current. No, there's no way. Boat, that right. clearly looks like wake. It looks like it's cutting through the current. Uh, you know, it definitely is boat wake. That's plus the, the prop. Yeah. Uh, right. Prop and it's not, the... it's not going super fast either. The boat uh, actually, if you watch the original, you actually see the speedometer and it's only going 15 knots. So it's not going very fast at all. Well, with something like this, you can either like it or not. And I don't really like this one. You know, I mean, and I agree, my eyes. We, we can disagree, but yeah. if you watch the motion of the boat, that's where it came from. So it's, it's, I don't see any waves emanating from that flat water. If you watch the video, it's, it looks like it's just the wake of the boat. Um, and it's yeah, not it a looks big, like it, it looks like it comes from the shoreline around and then up into the yeah. path he's taking. Right. It, it's actually taking, you know, you see that curve and it curves to where the boat was just traveling. So uh, regardless uh, of the video, I mean, the gate step, I mean, if you don't like that point, the gate step is really, um, uh, the step length is usually a really big indicator. And the fact that the, uh, the submitter keeps deleting my request to have a contact with them. So let's see if and, tomorrow you know, this, I guess. This yeah. could have just been a couple of guys with a ghillie suit out on the boat and on right. the lake. So they, maybe a little joke and maybe it grew, grew legs. Who knows? Oh, no. I, I think it's a Bigfoot costume. I really do. You think so? Uh, yep. Um, I, I just do. And the thing about it, it's the month of October. Even though it was October 5th, it's Halloween month. Yeah. Oh, it's well, also yeah. The, the, the holiday of the Patterson-Gimlin film. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of different things going on in October. Yeah. So. 
Um, Very possible. Yeah, well, um, and, and Thinker Thunker also put the Sasquatch up a tree. <laughs> like, how many Bigfoot can stand on top of one another? But that's neither here nor there. And I, I can't necessarily um, uh, well, say for. Sean had a good point. The, it looks like a deliberate walk, like a forced walk. Yeah. It doesn't look right. like it's a, a fluid movement of something moving. And I have a, I just have this own personal belief. If there was a Bigfoot over there in those trees, it would not wait for the boat to appear and then walk across the opening. It would stay right beside one of those trees and watch that boat from a distance, never moving. I just don't believe that's the correct behavior for a Bigfoot. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm a hillbilly, but. But a boat being that loud, too, it's loud. You know, so you, you could. Yeah. So, so what do you think, Sean? Yeah, yeah, you're shaking your head. Nope. Yeah, no, definitely. Nope. Uh, you know, I, I had seen it briefly before I saw you post that you were going to go, go over it. And this is the first time I've seen your debunk in full, you know, cause I saw just a snippet of it last or last night or the night before, whenever you posted it. And, it, you know, like I was saying to Chris, when you were, when you were playing it, that walk just does it for me. That just mm -hmm. puts it off. Yeah. And you know, what's kind of sad is it makes me go back and rethink the Freeman <laughs> Freeman video. Uh, uh, in the way that that creature moves too, so I don't know. I've always liked the Freeman the Freeman video, as did I. Yeah. And that and uh, someone always seemed a little bit off about that one too, but I've always liked it. Uh, if you know the guy, does he have social media? Does he follow the Bigfoot community? No, not a bit. Um, in fact, uh, on that particular channel, he released it on. Uh, there was only four other videos, and that was a, a post-hockey game party that was 10 years ago. I'm, uh, if I'm not correct, then they have been, even been when the Maple Leafs won the uh, Stanley Cup. So, You know, we talk about steps, Steve. Uh, I think it's in the first episode or two of uh, uh, Sasquatch Unearthed, The Ridge, right? I, I walk across the road and somebody asked me how many steps it took me to get across the road. And I clearly wasn't paying attention when I, I just bullshitted an answer. And as I watched that, like I went right back, like as I'm watching, I went right into the comments and corrected myself right away. You don't think about the little things like that, that attack yeah. your own credibility. Like, well, he, yeah. he can't even count his own damn steps across. I wasn't paying attention to be quite honest. I wasn't paying attention. I was just bullshitting an answer. And, uh, it's so in the ass. Yeah. In other words, you're going to fail horribly at any sobriety test if you ever get pulled oh, over. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was Well, this road they had us cross. It's a busy road. If anybody's been on that stretch of, like it's a 35 <laughs> mile an hour speed limit and people go through that at 65. And it's the place where uh the uh ambulance drivers, the paramedics had their encounter as earlier in the evening, like five or six o'clock is, no, yeah. oh, no, it was a little darker than probably seven, seven or eight o'clock. Seth and I and the team are out there and these people are just, we're clearly walking along the side of the road. These people just zooming by at 65 miles an hour. I was more worried about getting killed. I wasn't counting my steps as I was crossing the street, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, there's some questions about the channel and uh, no, the channel was not monetized. He doesn't have a lot of followers, and surprisingly, the video's got like 38,000 views as of this morning, so people know that this is the website to watch, or at least some people. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't appear to be a money motive here. Uh, I think he was just trying to, if you listen to the, the um, little speech he's making as he's driving the boat. I just wanted to show you the lake. Oh, oh, what's that? Maybe he was trying to pull a prank on his girlfriend or his significant other. I don't know. Or maybe a coworker. I'm not sure. Um, because this man has no social media footprint. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, all blank for the actual guy. So could just be somebody trying to make a Bigfoot video just to see how far they could 
you know, for, for shits and giggles. Honestly, it, does, it doesn't really say that. Uh, I, I don't see that just by the comments. There aren't many comments left on this thing. And there's one that says, oh man, you know, uh, it, there was a comment said, yeah, if this was real, you would allow comments on the video. And that was on the next video. So you look at people are commenting on the Bigfoot video on the, uh, on the, the hockey videos, the hockey party videos. And then, and then this person chimes in and that's how I got his real name that said, uh, well, you know, I've been, I really don't use YouTube all that much or something similar. And, uh, I think I fixed it, but he didn't. And the fact is, is that I think he played this as a prank for locally, uh, local. And, uh, he didn't expect it to go thanks to, uh, the mountain man. And then eventually, uh, the RMSO and right. snagging that, reversing it, and saying all of the witnesses are unidentified uh, and boaters, like there's multiple people, and then they, they mute the sound on it, they flip it, um, and then they, they come up with a story. They say, oh, well, they, oh, the witnesses are ident unidentified. Yeah. And how the hell would you get? Yeah. It got picked up on the Coast to Coast feed, too, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, and it's nothing but a clickbait, and I'm just wondering yeah. why it was reversed. You know, because you don't want that copyright hit. That's why. Yeah, that's why it was reversed. You didn't want to have to be forced to take it down. Right. Even though if you did a real investigation and a real analysis, you couldn't get it taken down. So. It was, yeah, fair use. As well, yeah, especially when you're trying to, you know, use it for right. educational purposes. Yeah, but there's no no graphic or nothing, just him slowing it down a little bit and zooming in on it, saying, oh, well, it looks like the Patterson-Gimlin film. Look at that. Hmm. Yeah, and it's nothing like it at all. Maybe the overall shape of the creature, but no. I don't know if what kind of video it would take at this point to you know convince everybody that this thing's real. It would have to be something spectacular to get my attention to make me really want to support it. Like we're talking national geographic, multiple camera angle, uh, more than 15 second video clip. Right. Right. I agree. Uh, yeah. Something screaming at the camera where you could see the inside of its mouth. That would be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kaiju Ninja says maybe uh 4k national, Ge national geographic maybe would. <laughs> yeah. But you got to understand, they set up for weeks on their shot. Mm. You know, it takes them weeks to get what they need and set a lot of cameras up and let yeah. them roll and a lot of review of film footage and stuff like that. Absolutely. Well, it used to be for to film in high definition, it used to be like a dual camera setup, right? They'd run, or what? Well, wait a minute. That might have been 3D. That was I, 3D, I, don't know. I think. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to have two cameras going. Yeah, I, I should know better than that. For 4K, I, I use my iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> hey. You know, there was a time when to carry all this equipment around, you had to have a backpack full and extra yeah. arms and everything else. Now you have your iPhone, man. You yeah. can, or you're yeah. so much, you know, you got your voice recorder, you got your camera, you got your video camera, right. everything right in one. And it's very handy thing to have in your pocket. Especially Absolutely. when you're out somewhere, you can get some really, really good quality video. I mean, you know, provided you can get a subject to film, uh, you can get some good quality video. Well, hell, uh, you know, Fleur is making an attachment for the iPhone. You plug it into the uh, lightning port and you can get some, yeah. you know, sort of uh, thermal yeah. on there. So, I mean, the accessibility is there, but it's also... When you talk about like National Geographic, that's still photography as an art. That's still videography as an art. Uh, most of us aren't trained to use a camera the way they could be fully designed to. Uh, that that takes effect of it as well. Like to get a camera that you know really would be definitive with flowing hair, to get a picture of it that would take a it'd take a lot. I'm not that talented with photography. Oh, it's uh, to get a great shot. It's you can't just point and shoot. It's, there's yeah. be some. You're adjusting your focal length. And you're but that's finding, what ninety. That's yeah. what ninety percent of us are going to do, right? Yeah. We're just going to have in our phone, trying to keep it in focus. Right. Um, 
you know, to get some real, you know, stellar photographers involved would be, would be fantastic. Yeah. But again, that equipment's expensive too. That's not, those aren't cheap. Uh, that's the thing in 2010, you know, I started off, I had a little pocket camcorder. I think I paid like 30 bucks for it or something like that. And I thought, Oh gosh, it was 640 by 480. And I thought, wow, man, I just, I have arrived. I've got this cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, you know, I, I lost some really good opportunities to make good video because of that crappy camera. And I went out and bought a, Ooh, at this time it was a Sony handy cam little hard drive camera and it was a 1080 you know it's hd camera oh this is good man i'm gonna go out i'm gonna get it this time and it's gonna be clear and and, and, no and they took the night shot off it you know they took the night shot feature away oh mine didn't have that yeah it didn't (laughs) they stopped putting it on the cameras after sir i had a high digital high eight uh to tape camcorder that still had the night shot feature i think it was yeah. the, one of the last generations that had it and they put it into their digital cameras for a little while and they took that out so i guess you know, Paris hilton ruined the you know <laughs> night shot for everybody you know the the sony cameras are you know i always had problems with sony video cameras they did not play well transferring them to any computer uh, at all um really oh, frustrating pictures. Yeah, it's supposed to be HD, and there's a lot of pixels. Not, uh, well, you know, a lot of people are using an SLR camera now for video and photography. Yeah. So some of them are using them as their web cameras when they're doing their uh, their webcasting. So, I mean, the, the, a lot of versatility comes from that. But again, you start getting into lenses. Some of the lenses you would need for some of that National Geographic photography, ten, twenty thousand dollar lenses. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um. Geez, I wonder if Matt was, you know, you know, who's a good person to talk is Matt Larson from Central Florida, Bigfoot. Yeah. He's really, yeah. he's the guy to talk to about photography and what, you know, gimbals and all that fun stuff. Cameras and gimbals. Yes, sir. Yeah. He introduced me to the gimbal. Oh. I, I, I just felt that's amazing. He was walking along, you know, and this, this footage was just rock steady and he's walking along holding this thing in his hand, you know, and, but, well, you uh, know, that's, you know, just that's the fun of it, right? learning uh we're learning a lot through these uh through these folks my friends at the small town monsters whenever i'm with them i'm always seeing what kind of gear they're using and you know how they're uh you know how they plan on getting some of the uh, good shots that they get you know drones that's another thing drones man like they're all over but they're not getting much of uh much luck with them out there either are they they make a lot of noise for a little thing that flies. And they, they don't take the wind all that well either. And the canopies don't help. And the landing zones and the middle of the forest, they're all very difficult things to overcome. Their need well, for some their need, their need for some B-roll. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're absolutely. It's advanced now, though. That, you know, you, you can, you know, like you're Steve, you know, you could fly it. You use your phone and stuff and take off and whatever. You know, the first time I tried to fool with my son's drone, I crashed it. So I'm not, I'm not good at flying those things. But now, if I had something I could punch a button, you know, okay, take off. You know, it takes off and hovers. Okay, that's cool. I can punch a button. Yeah, that's always the the answer I have to that question when you know folks ask that one is, with all the technology and cell phones, why isn't there better evidence? Well, again, it goes back to how we use it, and do we right. really know how to use it? And and it's. Uh, it's a skill. It's not just something everybody can do. It, you know, GoPros. You know the limit. The issue I had with GoPros, K- Kaiju Ninjas in there saying is the battery life was terrible yeah. when I was in my GoPro, my GoPro mode. Well, you know, it's uh, the 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 big kicker always to me is you see a Bigfoot first time seeing a Bigfoot. You ain't thinking about the camera. No. No. You're not thinking about the camera. You're thinking about Hold what still. the hell am I saying? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell what the hell am I seeing? You know, it takes that that uh, uh time for a person to respond to what they're seeing, just like any kind of thing. Like there's a you know, all of a sudden you see a fire and you you, you stop for a second and go, What am I gonna do? And then your your mind is quickly processing 
the plan of action. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, and not counting the shakes you get, you know, shakes the, and the natural reactions to stress. Yeah. Yep. And Bill Rigby. Hello. And you're absolutely right. Welcome to the show, Bill. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> same thing with Dinosaur uh, Hunter. I mean, these are a few folks we haven't seen in the show before in chat. So good to see you. Cell phones focused on the nearest object like a leaf. I said that all the time. Uh, the people, why are Bigfoot pictures always so blurry? Well, because, you know, you have them on autofocus. That's how yeah. these things are rigged up to be. They're on autofocus. So they're going to, you know, I remember doing stakeouts. And if it's a rainy day and I got that camera rolling and the minute the windshield wipers go through or a drop of rain hits that windshield, whoop, out of focus. Again. Yep. I just learned you could change the features on the camera on the iPhone. Like, and I'm a pretty tech savvy guy. And I just learned that you can go into the settings and manipulate it and change yeah. features. So that was pretty, uh, same thing. With I've been droids. using the damn thing right out of the box. You know, I, I haven't played with any of that now that I know how look out. There's going to be more tilted selfies I take. Well, you, know? you know more than me, Sean, because all I do is I can turn the camera on and I can set for what setting HD or whatever, then push the little red button, and then that's it. <laughs> but if you can get that down to a reflex, you know, yeah. where you could do yeah. that without thinking and looking, you might be one step closer. Yeah. That would be good. <laughs> Now, uh, I, will, I will say this. If you have a cameraman in the woods that doesn't believe in Bigfoot at all, and they're just behind the lens, they may be able to get a shot of it. And then, yeah. well, what did I just videotape? Um, but uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that, you know, that's why photographs, you know, we shouldn't bank on a good photograph. We shouldn't bank on a good audio because you can't see what made it. You can't bank on... Um, you know, uh, DNA without proper collection. So I think, uh, you know, and, and even now they're trying to uh, test eDNA. And, um, uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, we've seen CGI Bigfoots out there before. Uh, we're talking about it's easier to CGI UFO right now. Absolutely, because think about the reason why. Because when you're trying to CGI a living, breathing creature, it's very difficult to get that flowing motion. And you know, it still it's like, looks CGI. Yeah. You know, you no know, matter I, how good they get it, Disney, right, Steve, when they did, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tarkin and Rogue One. Right? Yes. The actor has been dead for how many years? They put a stand in, but even the face still doesn't match the words, no matter how good it is. It's still right. CGI and Disney can't get it right yet to that perfection. What makes you think one of us are going to be able to do it? Right. Right. Or one of the hoaxers actually. You're going to get it. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, like the, end of, yeah, we hear a lot of conversation about the independence day video with the big, big foot holding the baby. And to me, that looks like CGI. It moves. Uh, not flowingly, it moves kind of jerky to me. It's, it has no startup, you know. Yeah, uh, think, think about it. The resolution is just bad on that to begin with, isn't it? Like it's right. pixelated a little bit. I, I think yeah. the um, the the startup time on that um, you need you just don't automatically start running at forty miles an hour or thirty miles an hour. You know, you don't go from zero to 40 in, in, in an instant. You can't do that with a motor vehicle. You can't do that running. So. Um, a good friend of mine is a photographer of eagles up in uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, the Pine Creek Gorge. Takes a lot of photographs of eagles and a great camera, good setup. And driving down back to home one night he has a roadside encounter R runs across the street in front of him he stops I, I can tell you what this wasn't gets out tries to see in the field where this thing went can't find it but he's a photographer 
right? And his first instinct, you know, when he was saying is, I don't know why I didn't try to get a picture of it. I don't know why. Yeah. It just took me off guard, right? And this is somebody that's taken yeah. photographs of eagles. You got to be pretty sharp on that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the mind at work because it's trying to figure out what the hell did I just see? Uh, if it's not in your catalog up here, your mind's got to go, well, what could it be? Um, yeah, and there's a difference, too, between having a, uh, a road roadside encounter like that when you're not no way expecting, expecting anything to happen yeah. right. than a, a Bigfoot researcher that's out walking in the woods hoping and praying to get a video. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a, a, an action cam sitting in or some sort of camera in my pocket. When I had my first sighting, I forgot all about it. Did not yeah. once think about it. It was like, yeah. oh, well. But it wouldn't have reached anyway. The night vision wouldn't have reached the 100 foot yeah. there. that I was away from it. But, um, you know, still, it was, uh, yeah, I didn't even think of it. And then again, I also said I, I froze because I said, the minute I move, it's going to take off. Yeah. And I just like, oh. oh. <laughs> so you, you always... Um, and yeah, uh, almost every encounter is by accident. Barb Santi uh, made that comment. Thanks for swinging in today, too, Barb. Hey, Barb. Um, um, so yeah, uh, well, we are got about nine minutes left to show, and um, you know, it's been Sean. I love talking with you, man, because we've been down that road together for so long. many times. I love it. I always love my trips over to Squatch DTV. And uh, my God, how is, have you heard from uh, the wonderful Mr. May lately? Oh, I talk to Henry every other Monday night. We still do Sasquatch experience together. So he, okay. uh, I talk to Henry. He's, uh, he's been doing a lot of reading. You know, he always posts his book reviews. And, you know, one of the things we get from listeners the most is what's Henry reading. So we just started a little segment called what's Henry's, what's Henry reading. And, uh, <laughs> folks like his uh, like his review although he's getting yeah. a little soft in his old age because he hasn't given a book a bad review yet so i'm, I'm <laughs> waiting for that. Wait, wait till my next book he can give that one back. yeah <laughs> I, I enjoy henry's videos he usually puts out one 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 a week or so and uh, usually it's uh, about Loch Ness sightings or yeah, something uh, interesting uh, uh, you know? uh, let me, let me, uh, this is this is my book review i'm sitting here looking at my folder and uh, let me read this. And um, you're gonna review review your own book. <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. There you go. But while I'm sitting there reading the book review, and not like Henry hasn't been caught doing this before on air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, re I remember Never the time. Never forget that night. Henry was on what the uh, the gray zone oh. or the gray, with the, gray uh, Roman Melissa, noodles. the gray area with, with Melissa Harvey and all of a sudden you hear this little doo 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 from the naked gun almost. <laughs> Henry, are you peeing on the air? Pissing on the air, Henry? Oh, uh, oh, always that oh sound after he gets caught doing something socially. <laughs> oh. Ramen noodles. Oh, that was a classic. We had the annual ramen noodle awards. We should put that back yep. out there. You know, whoever has the best yeah. replication gets the case of ramen noodle. That was great. That would be, that would be hard. Yeah, hard to duplicate. Joe, Joe just donated some more money to ask this question. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the Sasquatch Chronicles? You, it's well, entertaining. Entertaining. <laughs> Um, you know, my, one of my new hashtags, thanks to, uh, one of our fine listeners, hashtag no scriptozoology, <laughs> no yeah. scriptozoology. I think, you know, it seems to me that these are very well rehearsed guests sometimes, not always, not always, but my God, they, he always has a story to tell why well, I, I, you know. There are a lot of dramatic encounters out there, more than I ever thought that have happened. I'll tell you that. And right. some of the earlier episodes, you know, some of the guests were, I think, a little bit more authentic. And you could tell that by how they would say things and right. the descriptors they would use. 
So, I mean, uh, over the years, it's, you know, gotten more polished too, which I think is. Right. And I, and like I said, I don't think all of them are scripted. Yeah. But I think when they run low, uh, there's a show Pack West Bigfoot that is, uh, you know, that tell stories of Bigfoot that are based yeah. on real stories, but they're embellished. Yep. Um, and he admits that right there beforehand. Yep. And at least that's cool. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I think uh, towards the beginning of the Sasquatch Chronicles too, they were trying to portray Bigfoot as this dangerous beast with sentinels and, and, and lookouts and all this other stuff. And uh, you know, you know, uh, if you want to, you know, yeah. you know, almost kind of trying to cater to the people that want a scary yeah. story, you know. Yeah, and like uh, I said, it's good entertainment, but you know, if you're looking for a research perspective, I don't think that's you know that's the avenue you want to go. You know, or you know, you really want a good horror story? Talk to my ex mother in law. <laughs> anyway, um. <laughs> Um, anyway, he did say ex mother in law, by the way. Yes. You know, I'll um, say this, Steve, because we've done this so long. Uh, you know, I took a 10 year break because there was nothing to talk about anymore. You know, how long you, I'm, I'm going through a creative dry spell now with what to talk about. So, you know, I don't know how long do we stay on the air? I mean, it's as long as, we stay interested in it, I guess, because it ebbs and flows. I, I always, uh, I always, uh, there have been days where I'm like, hmm, and I don't make a decision on what to do to a show to or like a couple hours out. Um, yeah. Because sometimes I need that pressure to come up with an idea. But there are so many facets to this mystery that um, if I can't find something, I'll go to my bookshelf and find something to talk about. Um, so if that helps at all, in any way. Um, yeah, I got a whole stack of them here. But yeah, you know, the I problem, always, I've not been able to get past the first couple pages of all these books. And it's not because they're bad books. I just don't know what it is right now. I've just hit that spot where I just, I don't, not a lack of interest. It's just, are you getting focus. burned out? Are you getting burned out? I, could be. Could be. And I think that's that's a little bit of the problem. Right so now. When, you're when trying you, to when you, content, right? You got to make content. Content's king. People want content. But I would so rather give you, them no show than a bad show. That's that's just Well, me. that's when you find a good guest. Like Sean Ford. Yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah. can't He's really right. control a little bit of a blow when, when there's going to be a new sighting, <laughs> though. You know? A lot of times um, we have a dry spell. There's no new sightings, nothing going on. Yeah, there's not a lot to talk about. But, uh, hey, we just keep fighting the good fight. You know, <laughs> hang in there. Yeah, and, and and my final word on just to get over to Joe K. My final word on Sasquatch Chronicles is give it a listen, take it for what it's worth, yeah. and uh, if you if that's the sort of thing you enjoy, enjoy it. They're not, you know, to me, they're not doing anything illegal. Um, you know, people say, oh, well, it's just a grifter. No, they're not grifting. They're giving people entertainment. Entertainment. Yes. You know, free entertainment. And the way they're paying for the channel is through memberships or, you know, anything voluntary. You know, that's the the uh, uh, the, the kicker on this. Anything voluntary. Uh, so, no, it's not. You're not twisting anybody's arm. People want to say, you know, uh, you know, dire ripped off people. Uh, there, yeah, there is, and there isn't certain things like the people who walked in to pay to see a real Bigfoot. Maybe they feel ripped off. You know, do they have a mouth? Do they say, "Hey, I want my money back." This thing is bullshit. Part of my French. <laughs> you know, um, if not, were they entertained? Maybe there was a sign outside the display for entertainment purposes only. I don't know. I paid so to it's see the Ice Man when I was a kid. Right. I mean, you pay and you pay at your own risk, just like you go to the the, the county fair and there's a, you know, a uh, sideshow attraction, you know, see the bearded man or see the rather the bearded woman, 
uh, or see the hair covered man, you know, and you go in there and you go, what the hell is this? Um, you pay to go to the Ripley's believe it or not museum. And you know, that's a right. bunch of BS when you walk through, it, right. it's still entertaining, right? It's entertainment. Yeah. And like the Bigfoot field, even in terms of its entertainment or it's, uh, you know, media is like Baskin and, Robbins, you know, there's a ton of flavors now. And if it, like you said, if that's what you like, go for it. Good night, Joe K. And uh, Keiju Ninja said Minnesota Iceman was better than Rick Dyer's hoaxes. Agreed. Yeah, I, I don't, believe it was. I, yeah, I believe it was. Kind of stinky. It's it good. <laughs> and uh, while while I'm on the uh, the thing uh, chessboard, I I did get your message from Joe, and I am sorry I disappointed you. I may have spoken out of turn on something there. I just don't think that there was enough definition in the shots taken of the earth to say, hey, look, there's a Sasquatch. The capabilities there, I think that maybe perhaps the the definition wasn't there. I don't know. But, um, but no, I, I did not mean to disrespect you, sir, and thank you for your service to our country. So uh, my apologies there. Um, so anyway, uh <laughs> oh, is Mick talking about meatloaf? Oh, no. meatloaf, Steve. <laughs> My friends are entertaining, and they're all full of BS. <laughs> yeah, and but you uh, love listening like... to them, or they wouldn't be your friends. <laughs> now, now here's the interesting thing. Um, you know, Dyer's claiming this, Dyer's claiming that, but other than TikTok, nobody's really given him any steam, are they? No, so I, I, I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah. So I'm not certainly not giving him any more steam. I appeared on that show for Nikki. I always said that he will never appear on this show again, and not after the uh, second hoax and his turn back to his narcissist, narcissistic ways. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> It's yeah, coming. it's coming. It's coming, and we're going to all laugh. And you know what? You're going to see a hell of a lot of great parodies on Squatch <laughs> DTV. That's for sure. We did the first and the second time around. Remember the chimps in the boardroom, you know? And when you see me start throwing out chimps, you know, Steve is kind of, you know, getting his funny on. Um, so, uh, in fact, you saw that in that short video I put out today that we're waiting here back. We've reached out to the uh so hopefully we'll get some kind of response from him tomorrow on email yeah so i'd be interested if, to not, hear if you do get a response be oh yeah i'm i'm you know i i don't know why uh the comments got deleted on youtube hmm. but we shall see but anyway uh That's sean any fine yes yeah, there is Sean, is there any final thoughts you may have for the evening before we say good night to our fine audience? No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I love coming on and hanging out with you guys and talking about our favorite subject, right? Sasquatch, yep. Bigfoot. Uh, Henry May. You know, there's a lot of <laughs> well, Henry May. There's a lot of great researchers um, out there right now, man, that we share the, you know, the states with. Pennsylvania's full of them, guys like Bill Rigby, yep. Eric Altman. Uh, you know, the Sieches, the Ruperts, great friends. And, uh, you know, and I, you're never going to be able to, you know, state them all because there's just so many. Uh, but I'm just privileged to be able to work with them. my guys, Matt Arner, uh, yep. fantastic human being, uh, Gwen and Carrie and Steve and Mike, you know, a new part of my team that, you know, we're doing some great stuff in central PA, north and central Pennsylvania, trying to get back out into the woods in a more routine way to, you know, investigate what's going on around here because the sightings haven't stopped. You know, again, it just goes to who do you report them to? And unless you're yeah. out there promoting it, you know, where do they go? So, and, you know, I guess the final thing is if you love being entertained by it, be entertained by it, but also realize that entertainment's not always fact. And sometimes yeah. you have to be able to really delineate between the two. And there's something that we always try to do. And I know Sean always tries to do is we always try to cut you the truth. No matter how ugly or even if it's not part of the general narrative, we always try to cut to the truth. 
And, uh, you know, if anybody's ever waiting for a snap decision on something, like I said on the other show, is that investigations take time, and I'm pragmatic about things. Just facts, ma'am. Truth comes out over time. So, Chris, uh, again, thank you, Sean. Chris, your final thoughts for the night? Uh, again, I want to uh, thank Sean Forker for being on us. It's always an honor to have you, but we appreciate you having My pleasure. every time you come on. Uh, thank everybody in the chat room and all our podcast listeners. Uh, if it's your first time checking out the channel on YouTube, hit us a subscribe, pop the like button, uh, share. Uh, sharing is caring. We appreciate you. Yep. Help us get found in the algorithm. Thank and Sean, you. if you want to stick around for just a couple of more seconds after we run the app, we'll sure. just say our goodbyes. Absolutely. So, okay, folks, on behalf of everybody here at Squatch DTV, we want to wish everybody a happy, safe, healthy week. And uh, keep an eye out for anything that drops on the channel about the Ontario Boater uh, Sasquatch video. I'm sure there's going to be an update probably maybe tomorrow, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, I have a good feeling that by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll have some answers, uh, whether it be something or nothing. We'll see. Um, again, everybody have a happy, safe, healthy week. God bless. Keep on Squatch, and we'll catch you all here next Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern here on Squatch DTV. Peace out, folks. Love you guys. Hey, folks, you've been watching Squatch DTV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.